Okay, everyone. Nice to be with you. Thank you for joining us here today. I'm here talking with Nell Andrew, who's my colleague and friend from the Lamar Dodd School of Art, art historian, wonderful uh, collaborator with the Wilson Center for Humanities and Arts and author of this wonderful book, Moving Modernism, which is a study in dance theory, it says in the front, but engages with many different kinds of modernist practice from film, painting, collage, and even just the action of motion through the everyday. And I'm, I'm really looking forward now to talking with you about your book and to celebrating you too, because it's a great achievement to have any book published and have a book published in the Oxford Studies and Dance Theory seems worthy of a special congratulations. So this is by way of a kind of a party, even though we're not all in person, but until we can be, I hope you'll uh, take this as a sign of gratitude and recognition, both for me and from all of us here at the University of Georgia, just how grateful we are that you're here and how proud we are of all of your achievements, of which there are many. Thank you so much, Nicholas. I'm really glad to talk to you about it and to have it, yeah, to have a, a book come out during these last couple of years is less celebratory than it might have been otherwise. But uh, so this is wonderful, wonderful to be here. It is weird, isn't it? Because you have this quite solitary practice, I think even sometimes solitary from your own friends and family. Yeah. It's always in your head with you, even if you're not writing or working upon it, and then it comes out and that um, sense of connection that you can have through book launches and conferences and lectures and helping in your friends a little bit taken away. But would you tell me now, if you didn't mind, just about how you started on the book? Because I was so struck by the, well, there were two things, the variety of the subjects you had and that beautiful dedication you have at the start to your parents. Mm -hmm. And this idea of seeing things behind the words. So it made me think that maybe this book and your interest in art history had a very long and deep yeah. theology that you might share with us. Yeah, no, the book, um, thank you for noticing the dedication. It's true. The the um, I dedicate the book to my parents who urged a love of language and wonder at what lies beyond it. And that comes, um, it explains the my kind of sense of art from a young age as being something beyond words. Mm -hmm. And so when I became a student of art, it was, it was, the words weren't enough. Um, and yet I was in an academic discipline trying to find the words so that we could have a, a discussion and learn more and make a history of art. Um, and yet in modernism, especially it was, it was um, learning about abstraction that I felt the most frustrated because abstraction, as I'm sure many of us who experience abstraction and, and appreciate abstraction, it's not because it's of its object um, the, the art that comes out of it is something that's beyond words as a kind of experience or a aesthetic experience. Um, and the ways that I was being taught that, the, the kind of father figures and mother figures in the scholarship that, that I was uh, emulating were giving me language, but it was never um, what I meant. And so I, I came looking for language for things that that at first seemed almost shameful to talk about, things like feeling and um, being moved, um, which seemed to me a place of meaning and knowledge that I got from abstraction that I, that I thought most of us could agree um, in, that study this, this field. Um, and yet it seemed kind of taboo to talk about the body in that way uh, and reception even. Um, when it comes to modernism, because of the way modernist um, history has been um, influenced by thinkers that that are interested in autonomy and in medium specificity and in and in kind of the Apollonian side of art yeah. versus the Dionysian. So, um, so part of me, I got courage to kind of bring body talk into uh, my explanations of art through my experience as a dancer that then led me into dance studies and the scholarship that's being done in dance studies, which has to deal with um, phenomenology and, and um, kinesthesia, kinesthetics, ideas of you know, muscle knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and so that became a place where I, was, I decided to put um, kinesthetic uh, theory in contact with abstraction, which would open it up, I hoped, to explaining to finding words um, for the experience of abstraction that that didn't seem to be 
correct yet, in my view. There seemed to be a lot left out. We were siphoning so much of our discussions of abstraction and, and into form, into the pure form, the materials, the support, the intellectual and optical illusions that are being made and kind of willfully shutting down the body um, despite knowing that, the, that something was happening there too. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, I love that in the book, actually, you were so careful to attend to things I would never have thought of. There were some of the dancers you were talking about, and you talked about their uh, bulky costume. And I thought, there's at least someone who has danced, you know, would even think that that was a equation, because these beautiful illustrations you have in the book. And if any of you get to read Moving Modernism, the illustrations are wonderful. And there's one of this kind of set of circles of uh, the shape of an imaginary dancer. Mm -hmm. And yet you still, you had that form of representation and you had that real sense of feeling and, and you ended, I mean, it's the thing I want to ask you about. And I want to come also and ask you about the question of uh, women's bodies within this and about the kind of the gender histories of these languages you said that you've, um, you know, had to come up on to make really with great intellectual skill and knowledge. But you end the book also with this idea of move me. And I, I totally get um, your idea of wanting to introduce feeling and experience. but. I was also struck that even a hundred years later, here we are now with another kind of manifesto too. When we think of manifestos, they're sort of bold statements, but actually I thought when I finished reading the book that this was a kind of manifesto too. And you said you've, you're very modest that you've intersected with dance studies, but it occurred to me as I read that you've also been making a new kind of studies yourself. Are you, you've obviously been aware of being at the fringe of things, mm -hmm. uh, text of modernist studies, but have you also felt that you're at the beginning of new things with your other colleagues and other work that's been done in the field? Yeah, there's um, there's actually a, a group of us that thanks to COVID has gotten together um, because we were starved for, re there were a number of books in on the fringes of dance studies, people in comparative literature and French studies and romance languages and um, theater and performance. And we all wanted to read these books and would have seen each other at conferences. But so we've formed a kind of reading group um, meeting monthly to learn from each other. Your friend um, Sue um, is in it. Um, and so, yeah, it's, uh, it's been a chance to see that there is something there. We are probably going to try to organize a, a working group um, with the NEH to to forge a kind of study of movement um, and migration and thinking about the ways in which dance studies, I mean, because I've been told by the dance historians that that what I, I'm i showing them the aesthetics of, of work that they've already been doing for all these years. And, and so it's opening things up for what they have been doing. For me, it was the dance studies that, yeah, that brought language um, and I keep, I keep referring to courage even, right, to, to bringing that um, to a, what is a, a very patriarchal and, and formal influenced um, academic discipline in, in modern art history. Um, and even across modernist studies in art history, modernism is in Anglo-American scholarship anyways, is, is usually placed later than it is in literary modernism that we think of High modernist art as the mid-century of the 20th century, the, you know, um, abstract expressionism in the New York School. When, for me, I, I line up much more with the the literary modernism of the mm -hmm. early 20th century. Yeah, no, you make me think several things. I want to come back to the idea that the patriarchal aspect of all this. But I, I was last week I was in the Judd Foundation in Marfa, and um, I nearly find it overwhelming the sense of kind of masculine control and the whole orchestration mm -hmm. of the space, but I was struck to how much what was being represented to us as a kind of American idea was actually a kind of commercialization of the Bauhaus, and so there are only, you know, European context, but mm -hmm. that being said, um, you know, to go back to this idea of meal presences, you know, your book is brilliant about data and it's brilliant about futurism. And yet, you know, still there is that relic of the idea that Dada was invented by Hans Arp in the terrace of the Zurich Cafe in Switzerland in 1916. Your book, it's not that it blows those things up, but it entangles these embodiments and these human and social experiences, often from the perspective of women artists. And I love there was a discussion of one of you said where she was not meant to have a politics, but actually you then find that 
the way in which your you know, kind of politics had been abstracted itself from her practice. Mm -hmm. But did you embodied and populated the book with these characters and figures that really upset these senses of male relationships, which have so shaped the history of modernism itself? And I don't know if you'd like to say anything more about that in general, or even just tell us the story of one of the people that you described, maybe one of the dancers, maybe one of the yeah. visual artists, and just tell us about them, because there's so many fascinating life stories in here, too. Yeah. Um, and I remember early on thinking about this project, I knew I'd be working with women dancers that had had you know flown under the radar for the most part um and got a good warning you know from you know when i was just a student that you don't want to just rehabilitate and put these people in to say that they were important you want to show you know what the, what they mean what um and so it was important to me to um i start each chapter with a photograph some kind of public or artistic image of how the dancer was perceived visually, and then try to work um, how that image is powerful on its own, has a lot of information to be read, if you think of it as more than just an image or a work of art, but also as, as a dancing body. Um, and it also became important for me that in each chapter, I explained canonical works of art things that that are in the survey course that I teach of modern art um, by male artists and then I show them differently after having told the history of the female dancer that that now this male artist in that lived in that same moment that may or may not have some of the artists had seen these dancers some of them we don't know if they were in contact but they were certainly in contact with with one another's circles of uh, um and so it helped to to kind of show that that what's in their artwork is could also have all the things that were in the air for this dancer that were being talked about that the critics around them were were talking about um and it might help to show some pictures i did bring some because it's i can't talk about this stuff without um without letting you see what i'm talking about um are you now seeing my my screen yeah, this is much better than listening to me. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm so grateful for your questions. Um, these are the dancers um, of each chapter of the book, or the dancers and the and the one female filmmaker. Um, and can I ask you a way, question? That, yeah, no, go ahead. But to go back, the picture of Fuller. Mm -hmm. I was so fascinated. I mean, it's such an amazing photograph. Um, would you just tell me about that image? What what's going on there, and why that construction is such as it is? It's a bird like. I'm sort of fascinated by Yeats and his Japanese plays, and there's this. Anyway, there's an idea of almost taking off there. It's, it just really struck yes. me. That's so that her, her dance is really, um, you know, the the kind of delight in that dance that she did. She's holding these long sticks, and the the gown that she has is completely from the neck outward, huge bolts and bolts of, of fabric. So she's swirling them. And the delight of the dance for all the critics was that you couldn't grasp her body, right? That it, you knew there was a woman underneath that moving these things, but you would see her face or her feet or something, but, but never all at once. And a lot of the time, all that was visible was this swirling fabric. And so the photographs um, would not have been done during a performance. There's a couple of photographs of her in performance that are really just blurs. Um, and so these were, were staged photographs. There are a couple that were outside to get a lot of light. It's 1896, so it's, you know, the technology wasn't there for them to... to... So this was a, yeah, skilled um, Isaiah Tabor who took this photograph. Um, and there's a series of them in different... Um, in different moments of her dance. This one, what I love about it um, for its abstraction is that it really has these moments of deep depth um, where you really get some clarity of like a bowl of crevice there and then flatness here and here where it seems to come right up to the surface of, the, of your vision. Um, and you've got the dark and the light the way that she's kind of part of the background and then coming out of the background it's just fills with all these filled with all these um 
dilemmas that abstraction plays with too about figure and ground, about um, motion and stillness, form and formlessness. So we have places where we can see a form and then other places where it slips away and, and it's just kind of sensation or... Um, and can I ask you that? It's so fun. And I, I mean, I loved, I loved the visual uh, conversation of the book, but tell me about the one on the bottom right, Jermin Dulac, and about other kinds of embodiment which are essential that came across so much in the book as well. Yeah, the um, all of them have a different relationship to the to abstraction and to sensuality or the body. Um, for instance, you couldn't see Loy Fuller's body. You can't see Sophie Teuber's body in this huge costuming. For Germaine Dulac, um, she made abstract films, but she importantly, she saw Loy Fuller dance as a young girl. Um, and so she's a filmmaker in the 20s working with, with all these major um, male, uh, the impressionist movement in, in filmmaking in the 20s. And she's, um, trying to, to, she's focused on the rhythm, not the body. She's focused on the ways in which dance is, um, and that film is like dance because of its ability to control rhythms, to um, kind of create inner feeling. Um, and the word she uses, she uses um, words for inner feeling or inner touch mm -hmm. that film can do. Um, and that absolutely let me hook into the dance theory ideas of kinesthesia, of how we have a certain knowledge that comes before we make words for anything, it comes before we even know what we're experiencing that is closer to the experience of the present than, than language could ever be. And that is the feeling of being moved into uh, awareness to, of oneself, right? This kind of recognition that something's been grasped that yeah. But tell me, I mean, did that also then happen to you when you're writing in the book? Because, you know, I've been thinking this myself as I've gone along my own writing has changed a bit too. And writing about liquidity and water has made me write differently than I wrote about mm -hmm. other things beforehand. And so you've, it's not, you haven't just been observing these conversations or these languages, you're participating in them both through yeah. your dance and your scholarship. Mm -hmm. Did you end up writing differently about different people in the book? as you acquire different knowledge of their languages? Yes, yes. Um, and it was important to kind of come up with languages for um, what happens in like a an image. This is an image of Loy Fuller that is quite abstract, but thinking through all the techniques that are here in this print, this is a big close up to show the texture of ink on top of the image that was getting at a kind of um, misty atmosphere, like the the dust in the air between the the lights in a theater, um, or the ways in which um, you can talk about about skeins of color that are physical. So I'm trying to talk to more about the ways in which um, paintings kind of move us. So you talk about the stickiness of the texture of paint um, in distemper instead of oil in this in this painting, for example, um, or flashes of light that rhythmically get placed across the canvas. So having thought of these, these paintings, for example, are in the book as examples of painters that would have probably saw Loie Fuller perform because she was a great celebrity, but they weren't painting her. And yet their paintings are part of a moment in which that made Loie Fuller's dance so pleasurable at that time. People were seeking a certain kind of um, experience from art that was suspension in time, that was a kind of the ability to grasp the fleetingness of experience and, and hold it for a moment. And I think the being able to describe fine language, to describe the ways in which these paintings do keep us shifting between foregrounds and backgrounds, between the materials of the painting and their deep space of, of an image um, that we know to be there. We want to see the, the women in these pictures, but, but we keep getting kind of thwarted from that so that we're still in that moment of desire and, and excitement. With that then, I mean, we just mentioned film there, for example, and I'm thinking about um, 
I mean, there's one modernist genealogy that might go from still life painting. I mean, you can imagine that Denis picture painting there from April 1892 is a kind of version of an almost, I'm not going to start almost realist with a bonard. I mean, they're, they're pictures of recognizable people mm -hmm. in recognizable places, even if you couldn't exactly say where each thing was. And yet then you move to something with some of the images you have later on, which are, I mean, in the, the Cubist work and the Futurist work, which are, if they're, there you are, unrecognizable, except the states of consciousness. Yeah. But you didn't, re you know, the book is not chronological in that sense either. I mean, it's, it's sort of overlapped. I wonder, would you talk a little bit about your idea of modernist chronology after writing the book? Because I thought that was very interesting in the book. Yeah, I mean, the one thing the book does is to, to posit that abstraction happened before its invention, which, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, like that. and that in general, Kandinsky here in 1912 is is often credited by the Museum of Modern Art and and much scholarship as as making the first publicly um, recognized yep. uh, work of European abstraction in 1912, um, and yet. I talk about you know the kind of the mo moves towards abstraction that other painters made, and saying that this wasn't as much of a watershed in um, conceptually or as it might seem. Formally, yes, it no longer has reference to the outside world, but it's after a very similar um, kind of ideal of art, which is that art transforms a flat surface into meaning. Um, into some kind of knowing. And that early, you know, as, as life became more and more about movement, about um, like a self-consciousness of time and it's, it's the impossibility of stopping it of, um, with the invention of fast motion cameras and um, porno photography and, and, you know, industrialization, all of that created a real, um, sense of loss of, of the stable moment, being able to, to be in the present. Um, and so I start, I'm telling the story of, of these different ways artists in the first decades of the 20th century came to abstraction as a way to throw a net over the totality of experience mm -hmm. um, while allowing for its particular its particularities to stay in the in play, yeah. um, that it wasn't trying to solidify and block out the chaos and the ambiguity and the the dialectical you know um, experience of modern life, but was trying to kind of let us hold it, let us um, see them both at the same time as a as a totality, as a, a potential universal that still held all of its beautiful particularities in it. Yeah, no, I really admired that in the book, actually, that you did have all of these um, points of constellation between these insights that were connected to each other and representative and historicizable in ways that really quite surprised me, actually. And um, but also, I'm going to say biographical, and that's not quite the right word, but uh, embodied and lived in ways that really came across in the stories of people on the page. So, um, I should have said at the start of all this that if you'd like to ask Nell a question, you could use the Q&A and I will check it. And we generally try to keep these things under the 30 minutes since it's our lunchtime talk. And here we are at 25. So I'm going to ask you one last question before we mm -hmm. have a question perhaps from the floor. And you and I could talk about this all day, but isn't that amazing? Um, of those pictures that you have left there, would you share one with us that means something particularly to you that you've come to reflect upon, attach yourself to, and maybe just tell us a little bit about it and then we'll have a question and we will see ourselves out. Is there one that you'd really like to show us? Oh, oh that's very hard. Um, know, but I, yes. You can yes, do it. I mean, this one's, this one's pretty great. Um, <laughs> this is the cover image of the book here, um, but I start the chapter with this book. Um, and Akarova was, she died only a couple of years before I started on the research for this, <laughs> before I learned about her, so, which is too bad. But I did get a chance to go to um, her home where her nephew lives now. Um, and he is um, 
was her dance partner growing up. So I had, I got to interview someone who danced with her, who lived with her. This panel behind her was in their home. Um, so I had seen it in this photograph thinking it was a big stage set, but it's just a little like a folding screen for a decorative um, space. And it made me really realize the, the kind of, and it was made by her husband who was a the architect. Um, she made her own costumes and choreography. So it was just such a, a kind of homemade affair um, that had such huge ramifications that they were thinking about all the most important things of their time in, in the arts um, from Belgium. So outside of you know, the big epicenter of Paris or Berlin um, or Munich. Um, but she's thinking through, this becomes the image of the book because it has this um, tying together of the way that light creates a sort of architecture because of the shadow here. Um, so that, and the way that sets and costumes can be fused and that we, we can kind of think of um, forms as living, as connecting, as, as migrating from one to the next and, and influencing one another. Um, so it, it kind of, it's a cool picture, but it's also really representative of the kind of um, transmutation that happens across the arts in my book, um, in which they all keep holding on to a singular kind of hope for art to be able to make us feel moved. <laughs> 